Thanks for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff. And a big thank you to my patrons on Patreon for your contributions to my channel. In this video, we're going to be discussing the medial compartment of the thigh, which houses the hip adductors. Now, obviously, this is pronounced adductors, but I like to say adductors to differentiate it from abductors, because adductor and abductor, if you're saying them pretty quickly, kind of sound the same. So this is the hip adductors. Now, for the most part, these muscles are innervated by the obturator nerve. However, there's going to be some exceptions as we're going through these muscles, and there's five major ones that we're going to be talking about. But before we go any further, let's have an understanding of what hip adduction is. So here's an anterior view of the pelvis. I know that this femur is technically a posterior view, but let's just go with it. And so in this case, the femur or the thigh, we're starting out in an abducted state, meaning it's away from the midline of the body. Now, when we undergo adduction, that brings the femur or the thigh toward the midline about the hip joint. So let's look at adduction to neutral. So here is the process of adduction to neutral. Now, you'll notice that in a neutral position, the femur is actually pointed a little bit inward. That's actually normal. The femur will actually not be directly vertically downward. It's actually at a little bit of an angle internally. That is normal in normal stance posture. We can also adduct further than this. We can actually bring it past neutral uh, across the midline of the body. So this process that we've just talked about, this is hip adduction. Now here's a list of all the major hip adductors. The first one here, the obturator externus or external obturator muscle, this one can assist a little bit in hip adduction. However, its major function is going to be external rotation of the hip, and we covered that in a separate video. So that leaves five others. Now you say, well, this is six muscles. But as we're going to see, this muscle right here, number three, the adductor minimus, is actually a part of adductor magnus. There are some sources that will call this a separate muscle, but we'll actually get to that when we talk about adductor magnus. Now over here on the left side, we're looking at a ventral or an anterior view. So just to give you an orientation of where some of these muscles are, this one, number two, is the pectineus. It's the most superior of all of the adductor muscles. If you go directly underneath the pectineus, number four here, this is the adductor brevis. Going directly underneath that, number six, is the adductor longus. Now you'll notice that proximally, the adductor longus partially covers up the adductor brevis. In fact, some images that you might look up online, the adductor longus actually covers up a, a much bigger portion of the adductor brevis. We'll come back to that and why that's important in a minute. Number seven over here, this really skinny muscle right here that goes from the pubis all the way down actually across the knee joint to the tibia, this is the gracilis. And then number five here is the largest of all of these, that's adductor magnus. It lies behind all of these muscles, so it's the most posterior of all. It's also the largest. And so really the adductor magnus exists all the way behind the longus, it exists behind the brevis, and to a really small extent behind the pectineus. So it spans really all of this distance, but it's posterior, so we can only see parts of it. Well, let's go ahead and take a look at the posterior or dorsal view. Number one here, that's that obturator externus. And it can participate a little bit in adduction, but it's mainly a hip external rotator. Number two here, this is the pectineus. If we look over here, number seven, this is our gracilis muscle. And then number five right here, this is adductor magnus, the most posterior of all the muscles. Then number three right here, this is our adductor minimus. Now, most sources will just call this a part of adductor magnus. However, there's this artery right here called the first perforating artery, and it actually penetrates between uh, the superior part of adductor magnus and the big inferior part of the muscle. And this artery essentially kind of splits the muscle into two separate pieces. And so some sources will call all of this adductor magnus. Others will say that this big inferior portion is the magnus part, and this smaller portion above where that perforation is, is adductor minimus. And then muscle number six, we can actually see adductor longus kind of peeking in through there. What I want to mention about the orientation of adductor longus, brevis, and magnus is they sort of form a sandwich. So when you make a sandwich, let's say a turkey sandwich, you of course have two pieces of bread, and then the turkey is sandwiched in between them. 
The adductor brevis is kind of the meat. It's the turkey of that sandwich. And so one piece of bread is the adductor longus, and the other piece of bread is the magnus. And so in this portion of the muscle right here of brevis, it's really sandwiched between the adductor longus anteriorly and then the adductor magnus posteriorly. So hopefully that makes sense. Now let's get into some of the details of these muscles. The first one we're going to talk about is the pectineus. Now the pectineus is innervated by the femoral nerve, and that's automatically a departure from what we said earlier, that the adductors are innervated by the obturator nerve. They are, except for this one. This one is mostly innervated by the femoral nerve, and not from root L4. It's only roots L2 and L3. It does have some innervation from the obturator nerve, however, most of it's actually the femoral nerve. This muscle right here you can see originates off of the superior pubic ramus, and then it comes down here and it inserts on the pectineal line of the femur, just inferior to the lesser trochanter. We can actually see that lesser trochanter peeking out right there. And this insertion point on the femur is called the pectineal line of the femur. I mention that because on the pubis right here, on that pubic ramus, there's also a line called the pectineal line, but it's the pectineal line of the pubis. Okay? Now, again, as we'd expect, this muscle is going to be a hip adductor. However, it can also assist in hip flexion, and it can also assist with hip internal rotation when the hip is in a flexed position. So if you are in a position of hip flexion, the pectineus can assist with internal rotation. However, if your hip is in an extended position, the pectineus will actually, in that position, assist with external rotation of the hip. Some of those details may not be important for you, but the main thing to know is that this is one of the hip adductors. Now in this picture, notice we can actually see adductor brevis right here, directly inferior to the pectineus, and inferior to that is the adductor longus. Okay. Now let's look at adductor brevis. This is one of them that is exclusively innervated by the obturator nerve, which has the same nerve roots as the femoral nerve, L2, L3, and L4. Of course, all the other muscles have been removed here. But with adductor brevis, its origin is on the body of the inferior ramus of the pubis right here. And it's a convergent muscle. This origin is actually the thinner part, and it actually broadens as it goes out distally. And so most of this insertion, probably the inferior three quarters of this, is that linear aspera. The upper part of this insertion partly is on the pectineal line, so it shares that insertion with the pectineus. And so adductor brevis facilitates hip adduction. It may assist in hip flexion, but only a little bit. This is primarily a hip adductor. Now we put some of the pieces back on this picture. So here's the adductor brevis that we just talked about. Pectineus has been removed. Up here we have the tensor fascia lata. You can even see the IT band right here going down to Gertie's tubercle on the lateral side of the tibia. This green muscle right here is adductor longus. Okay, you'll notice that behind it is adductor magnus, but right here is where we have that sandwich of adductor brevis. So anterior to brevis is longus, and posterior to it, you can see a little bit right there of the origin of magnus coming off of the ischial tuberosity. So hopefully you can see that. Now adductor longus is another convergent muscle where the proximal attachment's thinner and it broadens out as it goes distally. So the origin here is on the body of the pubis below the pubic crest. So right here's the pubic crest, and then it originates below that. And as the adductor longus broadens out distally, it inserts on the middle one-third of the linea aspera, and it is primarily a hip adductor. It doesn't really do much of anything else. Okay, powerful hip adductor. Now here's the adductor magnus. Up here we have tensor fascia lata. Over here we have gracilis, that's that really skinny muscle that goes down to the ped's answering tendon right here. We'll talk about that. So in green here we have the adductor magnus. Now, the adductor magnus has two parts. It has a hamstring part and it has an adductor part. Okay? The hamstring part originates off of where the hamstrings originate, the ischial tuberosity. If you look right here, you can see that attachment right there on the ischial tuberosity. Okay. We'll see a better view of this on the posterior aspect in just a minute. And then the adductor part originates off of the pubis and the ischial rami and the inferior borders of it, so more right here. Okay. Now, adductor magnus is also a convergent muscle. It broadens as it goes distally. You can see it has a very, very broad insertion. 
Now, the adductor component of this muscle inserts over here on the gluteal tuberosity and also going down the linea aspera, ultimately to the medial supracondylar ridge, which we can't really see here. It's more posterior. The hamstring part really mainly inserts on the adductor tubercle, which is right here on the medial aspect of the femur down here. And as you might expect, the hamstring part is going to facilitate hip extension, not knee flexion, just hip extension, and the adductor part facilitates hip adduction. Now, it can be pretty tough to see the pieces here of adductor magnus, so to really get a better view of this, we'll do a posterior view. This is a really nice picture because it divides up the two pieces of adductor magnus really clearly. So if we look here in this purple part, this is what's referred to as the pubofemoral portion. Okay? Remember that the adductor part originated off of the pubis and the ischial rami, but in particular the pubis. So the pubofemoral portion, this is the adductor part. What you should notice about this is that as the fibers of this muscle go towards the femur, uh, they have a lot more of a horizontal component, and down here they're a lot more oblique or diagonal. Okay, This is the adductor part of the adductor magnus. Over here in red, this is the ischiocondylar portion. The reason this is called ischiocondylar is because, remember, the hamstring part originates off of the ischial tuberosity. And so the fibers are going to run vertically downwards, and they're going to insert on this bony prominence on the medial condyle of the femur, which is the adductor tubercle. So notice for the hamstring part, the fibers are more vertically downwards. For the adductor part, they're more oblique or diagonal. You can't really see that too well in the anterior view. It's much more visible in the posterior view. The other interesting thing about this is that there's a split innervation between these two parts. The adductor part is innervated by the same nerve that innervates the other adductors, the obturator nerve. Whereas the hamstring part, the ischiocondylar portion, which is more medially placed, this is innervated by the same nerve that innervates the hamstrings, which is the sciatic nerve. What you should also notice here is distally between the hamstring part's insertion, this tendon right here, and the adductor's insertion, there's this hole right here, this space. Here's an anterior view of that space. This is called the adductor hiatus. And distally, it marks a division between the hamstring part and the adductor part. Functionally, what it does is that it actually allows structures that are coming down the adductor canal to exit and actually move ultimately into the popliteal fossa. We'll be talking about the adductor canal and the popliteal fossa in future videos, so make sure to join us for that. The last muscle we're going to look at is this really skinny one right here called the gracilis. In this picture, we put most of the muscles back. Here's adductor brevis, adductor longus, adductor magnus. They even, for some reason, threw in rectus femoris here. Whatever. But here's gracilis. Now, the gracilis originates on the body and inferior ramus of the pubis. The origin is partly covered up here by adductor longus. And it spans all the way down here to the tibia on the medial side, and its insertion is the supromedial tibia on a shared tendon called the pes anserinus or pes anserine tendon. Recall that this shared tendon is shared not only with the gracilis, but also the semitendinosus, one of the hamstring muscles, and the sartorius muscle, which is the faber muscle, flexion, abduction, and external rotation of the hip. Now, gracilis is a hip adductor. And it's going to also be able to assist in knee flexion and tibial internal rotation because this is a two-joint muscle. The other adductors are not two-joint muscles. They are one-joint muscles, so they don't have any action at the knee. The gracilis has a little bit there. It's not the major agonist of knee flexion. That's, of course, the hamstrings, but it can assist, and it can produce some tibial internal rotation. And like the other adductor muscles, it's innervated by the obturator nerve. I also thought I'd throw in some interesting things here on ways to strengthen the adductors. If you go hit the gym, you'll probably notice that the vast majority of people actually neglect this muscle group. And there's really two ways to target the adductors. The first method is over here, and that's just with directly performing hip adduction. This is not the only exercise that'll do it. Here's the start position over here, and what this person is doing is they're actually strengthening the adductors on their right side. So as he goes from this position right here to this one, his right leg is actually going into hip adduction. 
You may have to turn your head a little bit on its side, but if you look, this leg, this thigh, starts out actually in the abducted position. And by the time it gets to this end position right here, it's relatively adducted, actually past the midline. Okay, so this person would actually be working their right adductors. We can also indirectly strengthen the adductors using variations of exercises that we don't normally think about. Over here we have a sumo deadlift, which is actually a fairly common variation of the deadlift. And it's differentiated from the conventional deadlift because in the sumo deadlift start position, the hips are actually splayed apart. They're actually in an abducted position. And so the arms go directly downwards to grip the bar, and so the arms end up in between the thighs. In a conventional deadlift, the legs are together, they're already in an adducted position, and the arms are outside of the thighs. But in the sumo deadlift, the start position is in an abducted position. And it may not look like it, but as this person brings the bar up, the hips actually undergo adduction. And so this is one way that you can strengthen the adductors. We can also do a wide stance leg press, which works by a similar argument as the sumo deadlift. The feet are apart, which means that the hips have to be abducted. And as the platform is pushed upward, the thighs actually come together, which requires hip adduction. Another thing that's important to understand and something that was verified by EMG studies is that these two types of exercises target different parts of the adductors. So this type of exercise over here on the right, which is more open chain, targets more the adductor longus and brevis, but a little bit less of the adductor magnus. If you want to target the adductor magnus, it's best to throw in that hip adduction with some hip extension. And in both of these exercises, as the hips are adducting, they're also extending, so you're using more of the posterior adductors, which is going to be the adductor magnus. If it's not really apparent to you how these exercises on the left actually produce hip adduction, let's take a look at this over here. So this person on the right is performing a sumo deadlift. Now if you notice the start position, you can clearly see that the hips are abducted. As she brings the bar up, the angle between her thighs decreases, which brings the thighs closer to the midline. That is hip adduction, and it's also in conjunction with hip extension. And so beginning in the abducted position, as the bar is brought up, the femurs or thighs are going to have to come together in order to get into full hip extension, which actually allows you to work the posterior hip adductors, which is the adductor magnus. Hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of the hip adductors. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.